Hello and welcome to ASE's webinar series. I am Kat Lyons, ASE's Healthcare Education Manager. Today's webinar is entitled, Women in ECHO, Celebrating ECHO's Female Leaders. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over with you. As this is a live webinar, you'll have the opportunity to have your questions answered by today's speakers. A handout will be made available when the Enduring webinar is posted. To ask a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to ensure any questions are answered. However, this may not be possible depending on the number of questions presented. Finally, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, please submit a message using the Q&A feature. We have a technical expert there to help you out with whatever problems you may have. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers and panelists. Dr. Thaman is an Assistant Cl Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She is a Fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the American Society of Echocardiography. She is on the Board of Directors at ASC and serves as the Chair of the Echocardiography Twitter Journal Club and ASC Social Media Strategist. Her research focuses on cardiovascular disease in women, mitral valve prolapse, mitral annular disjunction, and innovative implementation tools for cardiovascular disease. She is member of ACC Women in Cardio Cardiology Leadership Council and started the PA chapter of Women in Cardiology. Dr. Pamela Douglas is the Ursula Geller Professor of Research in Cardiovascular Diseases in the Department of Medicine at Duke University. Dr. Douglas's wealth of experience includes authorship of over 500 peer-reviewed manuscripts and 30 practice guidelines, service as the president of the American College of Cardiology, election as the first female president of ASC, and Chief of Cardiology at both the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Duke University. She has served on the External Advisory Council of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the Scientific Advisory Boards of the National Space Biomedical Institute and the Patient Advocate Foundation. Dr. Madhav Swaminathan is a tenured pr professor at Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina, and the Vice Chair of Faculty Development in the Department of Anesthesiology. He served as ASC's president from 2019 through 2020, during which time he helped launch the ASC CARES campaign that focused on the well-being of the ECHO community. Dr. Swaminathan also led efforts to develop ASC's diversity and inclusion policy and create the DNI task force to address inequities and biases in the system. He continues to advocate for its equity and inclusion at both ASC and at Duke University through systemic and structural change. Dr. Carol Mitchell is a faculty member in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine within the Department of Medicine and has an affiliate appointment with the Department of Medical Physics. Doc Dr. Mitchell is a prolific teacher and education researcher, having won numerous awards for both, including the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography, Distinguished Educator of the Year, Cardiac Sonographer Distinguished Teacher Award, Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography, Joan P. Baker Pioneer Award, Dr. Mitchell is a fellow of the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers, a member of the Society for Vascular Ultrasound, American Society of Radiologic Technology, and American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine. She is currently a fellow of ACE where she also serves as its treasurer. Dr. Judy Hung is the current president of the American Society of Echocardiography. She is the director of the Echocardiography Lab Division of Cardiology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hung completed a two-year general cardiology fellowship at Mass General Hospital and then obtained subspecialty training, completing a two-year clinical and research advanced echocardiography fellowship, which included training in adult congenital heart disease at Children's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Upon completion of her clinical and research fellowship training, Dr. Hung joined the cardiology division in the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital as an attending cardiologist. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Hung. Thanks, Kat. I hope everyone can hear me. So good afternoon. My name is Judy Hung. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General and the president of the American Society of ECHO. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first Women in ECHO webinar. Next slide. This is held in honor of Women's History Month. Um, the discussion today will celebrate female leaders in echocardiography and how these innovative women have not only been instrumental in shaping the field of cardiovascular ultrasound, but also the ASC and the ASC Foundation. Next slide. 
I want to highlight the commitment of the ASE to diversity and inclusion. This policy was approved uh, by the Board of Directors in October of 2019 and reaffirms ASE's commitment to diversity as it drives innovation and value by increasing the spectrum of experience, ideas, and perspective. The ASC strives to build a diverse and inclusive organization at all levels, including councils, committees, task forces, faculty, and other volunteer activities. Next slide. Um, uh, Kat Lyons has already uh, introduced our distinguished panel shown here. Next slide. Since its founding in 1975, the ASC has had six female presidents um, out of 30, uh, shown here, uh, Pam Douglas, Linda Gillum, next slide, Patricia Pellica, Susan Wiggers, next slide, Vera Rigolin, and me, uh, Judy Hung for this year. Next slide. In addition to ASC presidency, women have served on the ASC Executive Committee since 1991. Oi Ling Kwan um, was the first female secretary and sonographer. And in, in 2019, Dr. Carol Mitchell became the first sonographer to serve as treasurer of the ASC. Four women, soon to be five, have served as scientific sessions chairs, Dr. Gillum, Dr. Riglin, Dr. Hung, Dr. Marielle Sher Crosby, and Dr. Sharon Mulvey, who is currently the abstract chair and will be the 2022 Scientific Sessions Chair. In addition, women have also played a significant part of the four ASE Council Steering Committees and Specialty Interest Groups. Next slide. Women have, are also well represented as ASE award recipients, receiving the Mentorship, Physician Lifetime Achievement, Cardiovascular Teaching Award, next slide. Next slide. Uh, Sonographer Lifetime Achievement Award, Pediatric and Congenital Founders and Excellent Awards, next slide. Richard Pop Teaching Awards, the Meritorious Service Award, next slide. The Edler Garden Lectures, Next slide, and the Feigerbaum lecturers. Next slide. Now I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Ritu Taman, and honored guest speaker, Dr. Pam Douglas for the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy, and welcome to everyone especially Dr. Douglas. We are absolutely delighted that you are with us this morning as we celebrate women uh, in ECHO and in cardiology. So I'd like to just jump right in and start with um, a question. And um, Dr. Swaminathan and Carol Mitchell can join in as well. Um, the first question is, what should be our top targeted programs or skills which have traditionally uh, seen underperformance by women? So that's a, that is actually a very loaded question. It seems very simple on the surface, um, but I think it, it requires a more complicated answer because one of the things that we've learned about microaggressions and systematic sexism uh, is that the playing field is not level. And so when we say that women have, for example, underperformed in negotiations because they don't negotiate as much for a job uh, um, description or for salary, they can actually be penalized if they negotiate too much because they're seen then as too harsh, they're seen as aggressive and they're seen as so on. So while women may negotiate less, it's not necessarily underperformance given the totality of the situation that women are in. And I would, well, all of us, myself included, can always sharpen our skills in those areas that you talk about coaching, negotiation, presentation. Those are all great areas to sharpen your skills. 
I would be cautious to say that the problem is not necessarily women's skills, but how women are received uh, in the workplace and what the biases are that keep them from being able to perform with the same skills as men. Yes, I completely agree with what you've said. And there has been ample written about this very notion that, for example, while women are felt not to negotiate, when they do negotiate, they're not getting um, the same things, even though they're asking for them based on these implicit biases and these um, preconceived notions of what women should ask for or how they should behave. Um, I'd like to have Carol and Dr. Swaminathan um, join in and see if they have ideas of, of uh, you know, other things that we might be able to do in terms of coaching or any other thoughts about this very loaded uh, question. <laughs> For me personally, I think having strong female mentors is really important because you kind of learn and you see how somebody maybe moves forward or to a position where you want to be. And um, while male mentors are great and supportive too, there, there's something for me personally that gives me a little more confidence when I see a female mentor doing that and then identifying that person to kind of help me negotiate you know, maybe where I want to go in a career path and, and how to get there. And so I think um, having more visible female mentors is really important. Um, for and role models, forward. of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree. First of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, but, you know, what going back to what Pam said, you know, it's not a problem with women's skills or that they need specific coaching in certain skills that they may be deficient in. That's not the deficiency. The deficiency is in how we view it and it's in perspective. So I think, uh, you know, making sure that people in an organization, whether it's like the ASC or a professional society or actually an institution, that people have um, inclusion and bias training uh, in order to just understand what our biases are, that we need to be aware of these so that we can address them. And, and you know, that opens people's eyes to the fact that it's not a skill issue per se, but it's, it's the way we receive it, how the way leadership perceives this sort of stuff. So I think uh, that kind of training will have a much more positive impact. Do you feel that that should be a trickle down effect? For example, you know, if the chair of the department decides that everyone has to have implicit bias training, it's one thing versus somebody lower down in the food chain um, and they're saying we need to have this. How do we get it higher up, uh, the higher ups to, you know, really buy into this and agree to the importance of uh, this kind of training? I'm assuming that was directed to me, but um, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's a difficult one, of course. But, you know, I think there's one approach which makes it a sort of a mandatory you know, effort uh, to say that, you know, well, leadership must be trained in this and we must have uh, diversity policies, et cetera. Now, remember, I mean, diversity, you know, requires policy. Inclusion requires leadership. But the point is inclusion. It's not necessarily just having a seat at the table, but you must go beyond that and make people feel comfortable speaking up. So leaders need to buy into that philosophy first. It's easier to have a checklist mentality. You know, I've checked that box, I'm good to go kind of thing. But that's not what it's about. The idea is to make people comfortable. And, and of course, like what Pam said was that have, having people in leadership roles, uh, having them as role models, you know, can launch a thousand ships like this. I mean, Pam did that for ASC, you know, and, um, and she's done that for so many organizations. So, you know, when, when people see visible role models at the top, then they can aspire to those positions and they can feel that those barriers don't exist uh, as much or that they have been lowered. So I think leadership has a responsibility and leaders need to be held accountable to that. Right. Yeah, I, I would underscore that you know, diversity is a quality issue. Yes, it's a moral issue, it's social justice, 
but it's actually a quality issue for an organization. And I would submit to you that a leader that isn't paying attention to diversity and inclusion and acting on it is missing out in his or her organization at whatever level it is. If they're not evaluating their incoming trainees and faculty with a level playing field and with objective criteria, they're gonna get a bunch of people who also think the same way and they're not gonna be very innovative and they're gonna miss out. Um, you know, if they uh, introduce their speakers, you had presentation skills as part of what launched this. If they introduce their speakers as, you know, hey, Ritu, we're really interested in hearing your talk today. And hi, Dr. Swami Nathan, you're such a world expert. We're all gonna learn from you so much. What's the difference, right? The difference is huge but you're gonna get the better talk when you say, hi, Dr. Thaman, I'm so interested, you're such an expert. You're gonna give a better talk, right? Then if somebody belittles you at the time you're walking up to the podium at the very moment when you need confidence. I just wanna to add to what uh, Pam said, you know, Pam talked about quality um, and, and leadership. And I'll uh, repeat a quote from uh, John Whittington, I think it was, uh, the creator of IHI, who a few years ago said, quality without equity is harm. And, and so we need to understand that uh, equity is what it's all about. Yeah. And that's a brilliant quote for this webinar and always. And certainly in the, the space of outcomes research, that's really been seen very clearly, certainly with hospitals that are penalized, that take care of lower income uh, patients, for example. So it spreads way beyond just what we're um, in our echo world. Um, I'd like to move on to the second question as um, it is asking um, Dr. Douglas, how did you get involved with the ASC and how did it feel um, Obviously, you were the first female president, but were there um, differences in um, the the approaches at that time um, as what you were thinking? Um, were there many differences or were you able to, how were you able to overcome them? Yeah, so um, I got involved because, uh, you know, my, my friends, my echo friends asked me to be involved in you know, 25 years ago, it was a much smaller organization and a much smaller group of people. And so, you know, in many ways, these were, these were my colleagues. This was my professional family in the ECHO world. And um, our approaches didn't really differ so much. I think maybe, um, you know, I, I may have seen a different mandate for things that we needed to do than others. I, I became president at a very um, significant inflection point uh, in the organization. Our uh, first uh, CEO uh, retired uh, the day or the, the week that I became president and Robin Wiegerig, who's now been, you know, our president for decades, literally. And I just, you know, we came into this position brand new, uh, both of us, and we, there were many times when we'd get on the phone and go, hey, Robin, what do we do? I don't know. I've never done this before. I've never done it before either. Let's make something up. Um, and what that did was give us a huge amount of freedom to do many things in the organization that um, created um, structures and organization and policies and ways of doing things that um, have served us incredibly well over the last 20 years, we, this was the first time we organized committee appointments. There were some people who'd served on a committee in the same role for 10 years up to that. So we sunsetted all the committees, we sunsetted all the chairs, all the members and decided which committees we absolutely needed to have. We divided them up into mission areas and put a staff person in charge of each one and then proceeded to you know, uh, invite back the people that we wanted to be in leadership. And, I don't think that came because I'm a woman or because Robin was a woman, but was because it was the right time in the organization to go from a very small group of friends who were, you know, doing things amongst themselves to becoming much more of a national and international organization. You set the structure 
very well and it served us uh, extremely well over the years and decades. And um, I know from uh, being friends with Dr. Swaminathan how influential you were in having, you know, a diverse and inclusive presidency as he is our first um, anesthesia um, president. And I'd like just to hear a little bit about um, how that came to be and how that really exemplifies our mission of having a, a diverse group of leaders. So I think ASC, sorry, Swami, you probably wanted to jump in there. Um, you know, when I became president, ECHO was relatively narrowly defined amongst physicians who were cardiologists um, doing complete echo and high end echocardiography. And we had a lot of discussions at that time um, as the organization needed to have, um, which have resulted in a lot of change in the organization. We, um, we had a lot of conversations with the uh, Society of Cardiac Anesthesia and we had joint meetings. So we had things on that side. Um, uh, and then uh, we also, uh, at the same time had conversations about point of care ultrasound. People weren't ready to move forward. We had conversations about vascular ultrasound. Carol may remember what, that when the uh, FASC credential was created that I said, this has to be for everybody. It's for the organization's excellence in ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound, it's not just physicians. And so we wrote and rewrote the criteria so it would fit for anybody who was a, you know, an expert in cardiac ultrasound. And so I think that's been that inclusiveness, that, that, that global mindset about who and what was echocardiography was something that I brought to the table early on and that we're still seeing evolve now very appropriately, doesn't need to be changed overnight. Um, and and I, it's just, you know, who I am and what I was thinking. Now, I know Swami wanted to talk about being an anesthesiologist, which is really important. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I thought earlier the question no, was directed ahead. to me, but um, but yeah, you know, I remember the day that uh, Pam came up to me at one of the ASC meetings and said, um, listen, the one of the issues that we have here is that in terms of diversity, we must walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And uh, why is it that, uh, you know, the, the highest maybe an anesthesiologist has aspired to in this society has been to chair the Council for Interoperative Echo, and that's about it. Why can't we sort of take this higher and, and, and have, um, and think about at least, you know, having an anesthesiologist president of ASC? Um, I didn't even think that that was possible at the time. It's just, it's the same issue, right, of um, diversity and inclusion. Diversity requires policy, but you know, inclusion requires leadership. And, and that's what Pam was instrumental in. Um, and when she came up with that sort of goal in mind and, you know, make it possible so that echocardiography and ASC is recognized as a society of a technology which has so many users, you know, it's not the domain or the turf necessarily of one uh, specialty per se, but everyone who loves echo and can practice echo. And so why is it that we must be limited in that? And why can't we extend diversity exactly in that way? So that was visionary at the time. Judy, Dr. Hung. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up. Sort of being the current president right now, I've it's actually been, it's fortunate to follow some of the paths and policies that were trailblazed by Pam and also instituted by Madhav. Um, you know, I, I can get the credit for this year, but I, I think the, the um, importance for me about diversity and inclusion is that um, it's not also the recognition of it and, and the recognition of microaggressions and unconscious bias um, that still needs to happen at the leadership level, but it's also instituting policies that um, that minimize that or improve diversity and inclusions. And there are a number of ways to do that. I have to say that, you know, MADA, um, you know, instituted uh, not only a statement from the ASC, but also policies where we actually look at uh, within our committee structure, our faculty structure, uh, to actually look at uh, diversity and, and inclusion in our selections. So policies in place. And 
uh, on a sort of institutional level, um, you know, I've been at the same institution for now 25 years. Um, and it's, I've seen a lot of change, which is, which is actually great because before it was sort of just talked about, but now we're not only doing, you know, training, all faculty are training, but they're instituting, you know, uh, positions that are diversity inclusion officers. That's their main job is to make sure that, uh, that you know, everyone's feeling inclusive. So I think hopefully things are being changed, but it really, it does need to happen sort of at a policy level as well. So and thank you, thank you, Pam and Mata for making my job very easy. Yeah, that was, um, it's so important. And it leads to our next question um, very nicely, Dove sales it. Um, so while wearing the diversity and inclusion hat, how should we be sure not to undermine other intersectionalities such as color, race, religion, uh, minorities, and sexual orientation when we're talking about diversity and inclusion? Who do, would you like to take that, me or anybody else? Call on somebody. Okay, how about you, Pam? <laughs> okay, that's fine, I'm happy to take it. I just don't wanna, you know, hide the podium here. I, I, um, I think it's impossible not to include the intersectionalities, so to speak, because the things that we're kind of, that we're talking about are creating a more equitable environment and a less biased environment. And that would hold true for any reason that we might be biased. Um, uh, so uh, that is one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is that in fact, gender discrimination is the greater problem in women of color than race or ethnicity discrimination. And we've looked, found this in several surveys for the ACC and uh, as well as other places that Amongst people who, women, who say they have experienced harassment and discrimination, overwhelmingly the most common cause is related to gender and race comes second and then parenting comes third. And for white women, it's race and parenting. And so by addressing the issues around um, sex and gender, first of all, we address the most significant uh, cause for discrimination and harassment for women. Uh, but also, I think as long as we take it to be about belonging and about equity, there's no label on the kind of belonging or the kind of equity or the kind of person uh, for whom we need equity or belonging. We need it for everybody. And so in that sense, it will float all boats. I love that. Floto votes. I love that. Um, anyone else? Carol or um, Mada, Judy? Yeah, I can, um, I can add to that. I agree that, you know, I, I love the quote from you about the, um, the rising tide lifts all boats. And, and it's a fallacy, I think, to assume that it's a zero sum game, that somebody's mm -hmm. win is equal to somebody's loss. Uh, that is especially true for men supporting women. And for years, and there was a great article on, uh, on Harvard Business Review, I think on, uh, and, and they show data that, you know, most men or a lot of men feel that it's a zero sum game, that, you know, if they are, if there's somebody winning, there has to be somebody losing, but it really isn't. And, you know, to repeat what Pam said, you know, this is a rising tide really does lift all boats. So it's not a zero sum game. And the sooner we uh, start realizing that, I think it's, it's better. It's, it's more important that, um, you know, there's space for everyone. And when you are involved in promoting uh, gender diversity, at least, which is the biggest problem, as Pam mentioned, you know, you get your biggest bang for your buck there. But essentially, this is something that will help everyone. There's diversity of thought here. And there has to be a certain intentionality to it. You can't just let it happen or assume that it'll happen because of whatever policies you've laid out. But there has to be a certain intentionality to it. And I think men... Um, uh, must understand, and this is where the support for uh, diversity comes in, is that it's not a zero-sum game. You don't have to think that uh, you necessarily stand to lose because of uh, gender equity. It's not a fixed size of the pie where you, you know, the slices become thinner kind of thing, you know, but you, you can make a big pie. 
And I, oh, go ahead. I, I would actually just even add to that, Mara, those are great insights, um, but not only is it zero sum, but diversity is actually positive, it's growth. Um, and, as, and I think increasingly, even the corporate world is recognizing that diversity actually contributes positively to the, to the bottom line. And, you know, a great sort of example of that is, you know, if you just have one tool, a hammer, you know, that's what, you, that's, that's what you're going to be doing as opposed to multiple toolkits, right? Multiple tools. So, um, and I think increasingly uh, we're recognizing that, that mm. you know, diversity is, results in um, a, a more positive workforce. Oh, yeah. And to that note, you know, when you have women on a board, those boards tend to make more money and do better. That adds to your argument. Um, clearly. And I think uh, Madhav's point of, you know, men have this fear. And obviously, we saw it in the 2016 elections. And uh, it was clear that we as Americans living here are not, we're not ready, the men were not ready to accept that if, if women got power, that they would not somehow lose it. And it's a pervasive myth. Um, as it were, in our in our societal fabric. Carol? I was just going to echo, I think diversity of thought is so important. And uh, to the hammer analogy, if you only have one tool, you're going to keep using that over and over again. And the key is really to learn to think out and how you can grow. And that, again, it is a positive, not a zero-sum game by having more diverse input. Right. And... Um, we love that about ASC, that we want to keep this because we, you know, are such an innovative society in our, our instrument, as it were, ultrasound, also um, on the edge of innovation at all times. We definitely need these types of, all different types of thinking to advance us um, collectively. So then one, another question I have is, what are some main solutions to this leaky pipeline? This has been talked about quite a bit. What's, what are the solutions to that for women in ECHO in particular? So um, the first thing I would say is, is, is uh, I, I would ask what the question is, uh, a little bit more clarification, because all of us tend to say, well, I know that women drop out of fellowship program or drop out of interventional program or black um, blacks drop out of these programs. And, and I just was in a meeting a few weeks ago with the diversity officer of, um, of uh, ACGME, Bill McDade, who actually showed the dropout rates. And, and it's not, it's not that much, but we have in our minds, you know, oh, I had a colleague who was so good and he or she left because of some other issue. So I think we need, we need to, we need a little bit of data before we say that people are truly dropping out. And we do need to allow for personal choices about how hard people wanna work and what they wanna work at. This may be you know, more true for sonographers who have, have made the decision not to invest in you know, medical school residency and fellowship, but rather a shorter training to, so that they may have uh, less of a barrier to working, to changing fields or to uh, working fewer hours than a female a woman cardiologist may have. So, uh, you know, again, this is a place where data would, would be very helpful. I think COVID um, has completely changed the meaning of leaky pipeline and completely changed the work that uh, women have to do at home and in the ability to balance uh, work and life um, and relationships, you know, the third shift, so to speak. And there's no question everywhere that you look that COVID has basically destroyed a generation of progress in uh, women as professionals. Um, the, the being at home, having the responsibility to homeschool kids or watch kids, Women's productivity plummets, their ability to put in hours plummets, and men, in contrast, theirs goes up. And so we've lost literally 20 or 30 years of progress 
there. And, and I'm not clear how we're gonna get that back. And I'm much more concerned about that than you know, the traditional leaky pipeline definition. We, we have a ruptured pipeline um, due to COVID um, where, where the talents of women are just as echocardiography professionals are being wholesale diverted into being, you know, K-12, K-12 educators, for example. And, and I don't know how we change that back. Are kids really going to go back to school? Are we going to be able in our relationships and partnerships to ne renegotiate once again the balance of power and the amount of work that who does and when people do it? And, and how are we going to regain our careers? If, you, if you've been on sabbatical, <laughs> on baby sabbatical for a year or a year and a half, because we don't know when this is going to end, how do you get back into that cycle of getting grants and writing papers and being considered for promotions and whatever when you know leadership uh, has moved on? You know, other people have lapped you. And, and then there's always the lingering question of like, well, at the next pandemic, she's gonna go back and homeschool her kids again the next time we have a lockdown. And so, you know, any leader would, would have to think twice about saying, yeah, I want you to run the cath lab when I know you've been at home for the last six months. It, it just is very hard to do. So I'd love other people's thoughts on that. I don't have any solutions for this. I think it's a huge international problem, um, not just echocardiography. I certainly know that there is an attempt, um, something called Marshall Plan for Moms that is out it being circulated and uh, not made into policy yet, but that the fact that this is such a universal problem for women across the globe and um, the academic output that is greatly suffered um, has been well written in nature and et cetera. And we have uh, an obligation, like you say, because A, we don't know when this pandemic will be over and when the next one will be. And we need to have not only catch up, but certainly the eyes are on this problem because our vice president certainly has brought this up and has reiterated that, you know, we have lost, women have lost 20 to 30 years of progress and what, what can we do about it? Judy? I can just make a comment, and I, I would uh, completely agree with Pam's uh, observation and comments on, on what COVID has done. Um, and I think the key for leadership is to maintain flexibility and, and, and do uh, think outside the box about how, we, how workplace you know, roles can be done. Uh, we instituted, we were fortunate in, at least in our lab, to be able to institute more remote reading uh, just because during the COVID thing. And that, that was, I think, extraordinarily helpful for a lot of folks who had childcare issues as well. Um, but, you know, the, whole, the, the thing about being flexible and thinking about different ways to do things is a common theme because... I, and that also gets at the, you know, the whatever the leaky pipe issue, the the dropout rate, which we have looked at so our ourselves for a promotion. Let's say just for, for um, you know, from instructors. So uh, female instructors and male instructors they start out at the same number, but by the time you get to associate, there is a significant decrease in in and uh, females who make it to associate. So why, why the dropout rate? And I, you know, a lot of it is probably multifactorial childcare issues. Um, you know, they, they lack of flexibility in, in, in care and, and unconscious bias. Or, but I think the, 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 the key is to think about flexible ways to retain, um, you know, different career paths. It doesn't have to be the classic, you know, male dump, male, way that people have been doing it since the 1950s or 60s. I think we just need a, a more flexible environment. I just wanted to add one more thing. I totally agree with what, what has been said. I, I, yeah, I think COVID just exposed, you know, some of the problems that we already had. But I think the issue is the way we, uh, we, have, we sort of quantify or measure success in academia, for instance, which is the, what the pipeline is geared towards, 
is actually biased against women. And so the way we measure success is, is actually uh, does not take into account the kind of flexibility that Judy was talking about. So when you start off with a disadvantage in that sort of hierarchy to even get to that point where um, where there are several, where life happens in the middle, right? And so not taking that into account will set you back because the metrics for promotion and stuff like that are all geared towards, and they haven't changed in, 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 in decades, right? They haven't changed in decades at all. So why would we expect the leaky pipeline to be fixed by band-aids, if you will, on the leaky pipeline? That's not going to work, right? So we've got to change the way we measure success, which has not changed in so many years. Carol? I think this is a place where there's, sorry, Carol, go ahead, please. <laughs> I, I really was just going to um, share again. I, I think it's just flexibility. And, you know, to your point that the leaky pipeline has kind of been the same way, that really it is time to look at maybe metrics and, and what, what would be the different measures of success. So, so I would um, agree with, with all of you, but I want to uh, amplify a little bit what Judy said about thinking about doing things differently. And because promotion and tenure, uh, job interviews, performance evaluations, they're gendered. The way we do them right now is gendered. And they're part of the structural sexism that exists in our institutions that we're not even aware of. Um, and unless we are, you know, we rethink our criteria for hiring somebody, like what do we really want out of this person and what their capabilities, and then get rid of the, I really like this person, or I could see them fitting in well or whatever, and go to, they've got an innovative line of research or they've got funding or they've got publications, very objective criteria. And we do that all the way along. We need to make sure that everybody, black, white, men, women, have access to APTs and promotions and tenure criteria, that they are non-biased, that they don't have any embedded things in them. We need to give credit for the extra work that people do. And this is a huge issue for underrepresented groups where they're asked to be the token on a gazillion different committees and can't get their own work done. For the extra work that women do as mentors, of, other, of younger women and actually of younger men uh, as well. They do more of that than men do or increasingly more of that. And if we can change those criteria and de-bias them and then reapply them, I think we will see different rates of progression or more equivalent rates of regression to men and women. Um, and so I would say, I think this needs to be very deliberate in terms of dismantling. Uh, and, and not just uh, trying to be fair because the structures are biased. Would you propose um, societies um, write, you know, what they, th they might think would be a more equitable um, uh, ways of evaluations um, for others, you know, different organizations to take up? Because the leadership has to, you know, it has to start somewhere um, in terms of, here, there's some other criteria that we could use for uh, promotions and tenure. And here are some suggestions or um, maybe in other countries, they've tried, you know, different, these different modalities. Just be curious to, to see um, what you think about that. Well, there's, there's things that other organizations have also done in terms of removing the glass ceiling. For example, NIH um, tried but had a political backlash, but other organizations have said nobody holds a leadership role for more than 10 years. So, Judy, the clock is counting on your time as head of the it MBA can't club. happen soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you say, you know, 10 years is a long time. Mayo Clinic already does this. All of their administrative roles, 10, 10 years, and you're up and out. And what this does is it frees up room for young people to grow. Um, and, it, and, you know, what we have right now is a lot of legacy, older white men in leadership positions. And it's not that they're doing a bad job, but it, we're not allowing our young people to grow. 
into those roles and we're not benefiting from the innovation and different ideas that they might bring. And so it's not just how we bring people up, but how we make space for them. Yeah, beautifully said. And that just um, dovetails nicely into another question, which is for all of you, do you think we should have dedicated grant awards for underrepresented minorities or specifically for women? And is that a risk for deepening the divide that already exists? Um, I, I uh, just heard some really interesting data from NIH about cohort grants, um, which is, uh, you know, as, as you all know, NIH allows uh, your first R01 gives you extra points for your first R01. So to try to get people in the game. And so there's a beneficial there. Um, what they've started to do now is, is several different things. One of them is a cohort grant where they're giving money to institutions to hire diversity-minded candidates. They're not necessarily of any specific uh, race or ethnic group or gender, but people who embed diversity in who they are and their research and what they do. So, so it's not it's bringing that idea into the marketplace. It's not based on skin color, it's based on ideas and, and what you bring to that. And treating it as a cohort, meaning there'll be three people um, at Harvard and three people at Duke and three people at Pittsburgh. And, um, and those people will get together nationally as a group and be mentored nationally as a group so that they have a peer group who are all moving things together. It's not just let's bring in the token woman or the token black or the token whatever, and they're all alone. These people move as a cohort and they're mentored and they're visible and they're mentored to, at the highest level because they are visible. And that sort of doubles the impact. And so I think there are ways of doing that um, in other organizations, obviously NIH is a huge national funder, which funds tens of hundreds of thousands of grants every year. Uh, but I think there are ways to, to say, we're valuing the, the concepts of diversity, equity, inclusion, not necessarily the people, but the concepts. And that generally, it's usually women that are working on heart disease and women and, and so on. And health equity is often um, by, by race and ethnic, ethnic underrepresented groups. It will advantage that kind of research as well as those individuals, uh, but let's give them an extra boost. Um, uh, so let's not just, uh, you know, send them out on the playing field all alone by themselves to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, um, you know, I had discussed that a little while ago, but uh, the issue of uh, having certain specific grants directed towards or assigned for uh, only women candidates or minority candidates. I think personally, that's a good idea. And here's why. Um, we already have a system of bias when it comes to grant awardees um, or any kind of awardees um, because, it's, because we have a selection bias. We just do, committees do. Um, and so having a separate sort of grant mechanism which is reserved, if you will, uh, for underrepresented minorities or, and, and or women, the, what happens is that you encourage more and more of them to apply when they normally would not have. And we've seen that in some societies and some grant mechanisms where um, there are uh, women who are in my organizations, uh, organization who, uh, who then sort of got revved up and got excited about a, applying for a grant award because it was designed specifically in that domain. And so they would not have applied otherwise because they would have feared uh, possibly, you know, not being able to get it because they were not competitive enough or, or, or whatever. But the, the idea was that I think this particular grant mechanism allowed them to be a little more enthusiastic and apply and gain more expertise. And then because of that experience, then be able to apply again for other awards. So I think that had a very positive impact. Uh, by just having those sort of awards reserved for women or underrepresented minorities. So I think personally, from that aspect, it could be a good idea. The point, I would just like to highlight uh, Pam's point that she eloquently stated about, you know, it's not just inviting them. 
um, it's how it's how to include them. And I, I really like um, the NIH mm -hmm. example of the restructuring of, uh, about making it not just the token, but the cohort. And, you know, the, it's the way to think about it is, you know, it's, you, you, you invite them to the party, but you also got to get them on the dance floor. Right. It's that's diversity, inviting them. But inclusion is getting them on the dance floor. And belonging is if they can dance yeah. like no one's watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Love them. but it's two, it's, 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 it's both concepts, right? right. Yeah. Carol, anything? Again, I mean, I think um, the idea behind a grant just for a woman to uh, apply to, it is inviting, but I think that um, as Dr. Douglas talked about the cohort example, I think there is just something in numbers to strength in numbers. So knowing that you can move through this cohort and you are involved in something, it's one thing just to be invited, but it's another thing to get involved. Yes, agreed. Strategy should take in both. I think. Right. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pivot uh, to Carol and in invite her to speak and um, she has been introduced but I just like to reiterate um, her extraordinary um, talents that have been showcased in her numerous awards and the fact that she's an extraordinarily uh, adept treasurer for the ASC um, and uh, overall um, amazing um, sonographer and, and human so we're very thrilled to have her here. Um, go ahead, Carol. Well, thank you. And next slide. So I have the opportunity to talk about the ASE Foundation. And the ASE Foundation is ASE's charitable arm. It was created in 2003 to provide support for initiatives such as training scholarships, scientific research, and it's not supported by ASE membership dues. Each year, we look to ASC members, the greater community of healthcare providers, corporate and industry partners, and other foundations to secure funding to actualize our goals. And a vision for the ASC Foundation is to be the driving force for improving healthcare for all through the use of cardiovascular ultrasound. Next slide. We have several initiative areas that you can donate to. The first is research and donations in this category invest in the careers of investigators and fund new echo research. We also have travel grants and scholarships. Donations in this category foster echo careers by furthering educational opportunities. We have global and health outreach and donations in this category standardize universal patient care through guideline translations, dissemination of the guidelines, and we reach the underserved through clinical training and direct patient care events. The patient engagement category donations tell patients about echocardiography, increase the awareness of cardiovascular ultrasound, and provide information about the crucial role that ultrasound plays in optimizing patient care. And the area of greatest need, if you donate to this category, these are unrestricted donations. So these donations will go to the area where it's most needed for financial support. Next slide. In honor of Women's History Month, our Spring Giving Month campaign focused on honoring women in our lives, family members, mentors, supervisors, all whom have had an impact on who we are. Next slide. We have several opportunities with ASEF and two I want to highlight. Um, in 2021, we have council training grants that are available. These grants cover trainee registration for the ASC 2021 virtual experience. The applications are open and they close April 12th and you can follow the link provided here for more information about that opportunity. We also have the 2023 Pamela S. Douglas Research Scholar Award. This was created in honor of Dr. Douglas, our 13th president and our speaker today on the panel. This is a one-year scholarship of $75,000 to ensure protected time and mentorship for an individual to pursue impactful research in cardiovascular ultrasound. Our next application cycle opens August 1st, 2022, but information about the award can be found at the following link. Next slide. 
And now it's an opportunity to share with you that you are invited to play a role in the future of cardiovascular ultrasound and become a supporter of the foundation. Our annual appeal goal is to raise $200,000 by December 31st of this year. We've raised over $22,000 thus far. We also have the Pamela S. Douglas Research Scholarship Endowment Fund. We have a goal of raising $375,000 by December 31st of this year, and we've raised over $80,000 thus far. When you give, you may direct your gift to projects that are most aligned with your personal priorities or make an unrestricted contribution that can go to the area of greatest need. And investing in the foundation is an investment in our profession, our field, and can improve patient care. Together, we can make a world of difference. And I invite you to follow the link below to find out more about the ASC Foundation and how you can support our projects and vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And for all who are joining us today, I hope you will um, participate in our wonderful initiatives and support our diverse and inclusive community and um, help us further our mission. It's been a absolutely marvelous discussion and I would like to thank our honored and um, guest speakers, um, Dr. Hung, our current president, Dr. Pamela Douglas, and uh, Dr. Um, Madhav Swaminathan, past president, and um, Carol Mitchell, and uh, for this incredibly insightful um, discussion on diversity and inclusion, which marks the first uh, webinar for Women in Echo. And I do hope we will continue to have more vigorous discussions as um, in the future as well. So thank you again. And I will close out and any housekeeping. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. A handout will be made available when the Enduring webinar is posted. We would like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and a very special thanks to all of our esteemed speakers and panelists for the important discussion highlighting the role of women in ECHO. You can register for all live and on-demand webinars in the ASC Learning Hub. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again all for joining us.